Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to contribute to these um, courses. Uh, so, hello everybody. My, as you said, my name is Francois Sarza. I'm a professor at Sorbonne University. I'm an ecologist working mostly on conservation biology. I will take a little, talk a little bit about that in that presentation. And I'm based uh, in a la joint lab from my university, the CNRS, and the Museum of Natural History, which is close to there, uh, close to the River Seine uh, in Paris, in a, a lab dedicated to ecology and conservation sciences, the Cisco Lab, where with many colleagues we try to address questions concerning the uh, biodiversity crisis. So I will talk about that today to you. But first of all, I will. Uh, try to reintroduce some general uh, meanings about what we are going to talk when we talk about biodiversity. I'm quite sure that all of you have already uh, quite a big idea about biodiversity because many, many citizens, even if they don't have any uh, uh, particular knowledge about that, have a general culture about this question. So probably at the beginning you will uh, consider that I'm just opening open door. <laughs> I hope it will be the case. But whenever you have any questions, please ask me. I may have too, many too much material for the, for the course, so uh, whenever I see that I'm too long, I will probably skip some slides, but you will get it anyway. And I will try to uh, keep some time for discussion at the end of the presentation. So when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about the, about bi the biological diversity. So there are different kinds of definitions, but whenever we are a bit lost with that, we can go back to the definition provided by the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was uh, set up uh, in 1992 during the second uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, uh, where biodiversity, uh, biological diversity was uh, defined as uh, the variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complex of which they are part. So this includes, it includes diversity within species, that is to say mostly genetic diversity and di diversity of, between individuals, of traits between individuals, between species and between ecosystems. And I would just take a few seconds to remind you what a species is from a biological point of view. This is lineage of individuals that are able to breed together, to share genes, and to produce viable uh, uh, offsprings uh, in, the, in the future. That is to say that even that definition is very tricky for many organisms that do not really belong to the same species but are able to interbreed, etc. So anyway, we will use that definition for that presentation. And in the uh, Convention of Biological Diversity, there are many, many differences, you can, definitions. Sorry, you can go uh, on their website, you will, you will find that. But it is very interesting to see that the second definition that they provide concerns biological resources. And you can find here that it includes genetic resources, organisms, and part of therefore population or any other biotic component of ecosystem with actual or potential use or value for humanity. And it is very nice to see that they clearly discriminate biodiversity from biological resources, because here you have the, uh, some kind of rational definition of what all life forms are, and here you have some definition of what we are using from that, and you will see that in the followings that will be interesting to discriminate, discriminate both, because very often when we talk about the other livings, as I will say, sometimes we directly go to that, forgetting that we should discuss about that, okay? Um, so clearly when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about genes, individuals, populations within species. There might be different definition of different populations for the same species. Communities, which are assemblage of uh, species within ecosystems. So when you consider communities within their uh, physical and chemical environment, uh, soil, air, etc., mm -hmm. uh, water. And of course, more and more discussion about social ecosystems that include human populations, human cultures that are shaped by humans, mostly. With some people considering that humans, of course, are part of that, are part of biodiversity. 
So sometimes, should we discriminate social ecosystem from ecosystem? Since humans are part of biodiversity, they are part of ecosystem. There are different kinds of discussion about that. And what is the common ground for all these life forms? This is their history and their current processes of history, which is evolution. That is to say that we all share this um, uh, history of evolution with this, uh, lat sometimes we say tree of life, which is not really a tree, it is more a bush than a tree, uh, with the present uh, view about this uh, diversification of uh, life forms that goes from very short term and small scale processes we call microevolution, the fact that at the level of this gene exchange between individuals, there are mutations, there are selections, all individuals don't survive and breed uh, the, as the same and other. There are migrations, movements from one population to the other, so genes, gene flows from place to place. And in small populations, there may be some genetic drift. That is to say that by stochastic sampling, by chains or uh, poor chains, <laughs> uh, some genes may uh, be retained or eliminated. And this microevolution at the level of population and on the time scale from generation to generation, so evolution is everywhere at every time, uh, you have by the end some macroevolution that shapes this tree of life through extinction, extinction of big lineage of species and speciation. You may have extinctions of populations, but species may remain uh, alive somewhere else. And when the world species is uh, extinct, you have that kind of process. So that means that evolution is on short and long term. And there are also it's been described some major evolutionary transitions, for example, from unicellular to multicellular, from uh, uh, life forms that are alone to uh, colonial uh, forms or big social forms. Uh, also transition towards culture, which is, of course, a human trait, but which is shared with some other species that are able to transmit information and to share information uh, without genetic uh, support for that, but through uh, culture. So there are different kind of uh, processes that shape that evolution. And this evolution is shaped by ecological interactions. That is to say that these organisms have interactions between themselves, so very crude things that you probably all know. Some negative interactions through competitions, predation, consumption of uh, prey of, of uh, predator by of uh, prey by predator or um, herbs by herbivores, for example. Parasitism. So in that case, for all these three kinds of interactions, you have uh, losers and sometimes uh, winners. I would say but they shape their co-evolution uh, in this uh, kind of interactions. And you have also um, some more neutral uh, interactions with commensalisms, which is, means that some species may uh, benefit from the presence of others without affecting them too much or significantly. And you may have also a lot of interactions that are positive for both uh, interactors. For example, for example uh, roots of many plants have roots that need uh, fungi uh, to uh, operate and to uh, maintain the <laughs> earth of plants. So this uh, interaction shapes uh, the uh, kind of uh, dynamics that these uh, organisms may have within the ecosystems and shape also their uh, evolution through co-evolution between the traits of the species. So that goes from uh, population dynamics, that is to say that in that case you have change in the number, in the abundance and distribution of organisms within populations, between populations of the same species through what we call metapopulation, through very basic and obvious uh, processes that are survival, reproduction and migration, immigration and emigration, dispersal. These three processes, survival, reproduction, and dispersal, are absolutely universal among uh, life forms, and they shape all dynamics of all organisms, from bacteria to big uh, 
wells or trees at different speeds, at different scales, but they shape all the dynamics of this population. And these dynamics are naturally expanding whenever organisms are fit to their environments, they have traits that are well adapted to their environments, they grow and they grow naturally exponentially or geometrically. So having some explosions of population is simply normal. There is no uh, problem about that. But of course, in all environments, there are limits in these environments, physical limits or interactions with other species that makes that these populations can't grow forever. They face some stochastic events, some va uh, random variation of the environment, and some random realization also of these uh, three kind of processes at the individual level. They show the feedback of the density of the population. They suffer from that, positively or negatively. Which is to say that, for example, at low, uh, when populations are very small, they may benefit from the arrival of new individuals. So this is a positive density dependence. But at the contrary, they may uh, suffer from big density through, of course, through competition for resources, but also through uh, spread of um, pathogens. Uh, you all remember the big lockdown that we had, and we all had to be separated from each other. That was a pure problem of density dependence in order to reduce our level of interactions and the spread of this um, pathogen. And if you look at natural populations, you may see a very big diversity of uh, uh, dynamics, for example, for this uh, um, blue and gray tits here in uh, English uh, woods close to Oxford, you have variations over decades here, depending on the environment, depending on the density dependence, etc. And you may have some simplistic uh, experimental uh, uh, dynamics here uh, corresponding to what can be observed in a lab when you observe the uh, paramecium uh, compared to a theoretical dynamics, you can see something very similar here. Another concept that is particularly uh, useful in ecology is the concept of ecological niche, which is uh, a, some kind of multidimensional uh, description or conception of what are the conditions that are beneficial to a given organism. That are the, what are the conditions of life, of good life for this organism? So the conditions that make that these organisms will have, from an evolutionary point of view, a good fitness, that is to say, an ability to survive, to breed, to not be obliged to disperse, etc. So it is often very difficult to represent that in so many dimensions, because you can imagine that there are physical dimensions of temperature, uh, pH, uh, etc. Uh, and there are also biological uh, dimensions. And you can see uh, in many examples, for example, in this example between these two uh, small birds, uh, some very small uh, com uh, birds compared, um, very small passerines, for, sorry, not hatch, uh, two species that are very close in terms of ecology. And when they are um, all together or when they are uh, slightly separated geographically, geographically uh, they show differences in their diet, which shows the, the effect of competition and the overlap of their niche that may uh, affect uh, their distribution in space and their uh, behavior uh, according to their availability of these resources that they are, are competing for. So uh, according to this uh, overlap, of niche between organisms. Ecosystems are composed of a large number of organisms. Generally, we describe mostly uh, macro uh, organisms, uh, vertebrates, uh, trees, uh, herbs, etc. But if you consider also all the uh, micro organisms that are in ecosystems, you have thousands of uh, species that are likely to be uh, at the same place sometimes in, in many uh, sites. And these organisms, uh, these um, ecosystems are composed at different levels of communities that share uh, different kinds of links 
of interactions, positive and negative ones. So you have networks of interactions within ecosystems. Depending on the spatial heterogeneity of this uh, environment, for example, if you take this picture in uh, Sweden, uh, all that is an ecosystem. But if you go there, you have an aquatic ecosystem. If you go there, you are in something quite dry on this rock, which has another kind of uh, uh, communities. If you go on the forest over there, you will have something else again, perhaps with some big mammals that uh, live in this environment, et cetera, et cetera. So even the definition, the, the, the special scale of definition of an ecosystem is not even clear for specialists because this is some kind of fractal uh, uh, structure that makes that each time you change your scope, you change the kind of interactions and the kind of assemblage that you are going to consider. So ecosystems are characterized by the species assemblage that uh, makes the composition of the ecosystem. It will also have consequences uh, and huge consequences on the flow of matter and energy within this ecosystem. So mostly uh, people working on ecosystem functioning work mostly in terms of flow of uh, nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, etc. And um, uh, quantity of organic matter in these ecosystems. It is important to remind that ecosystems are also connected to each other. Generally, they may be isolated, but uh, in many cases they are connected. So they exchange organisms, they exchange species, that new species that arrive, some that go locally extinct. And this dynamics is very important in the dynamic of the ecosystem. And this characteristic shapes the kind of resistance that this ecosystem may show towards environmental change, natural ones and, of course, anthropized ones and their resilience, that is to say, their ability to go back more or less quickly to their present state after a perturbation. But clearly, even if at our individual scale, at human scale, we may consider that ecosystems are mostly states, are mostly uh, stable things, we, you have to remember that each time you talk about living things, you have to consider dynamics and to consider that everything changes everywhere, every time. It's just a matter of speed, a matter of perception. Sometimes it is quite larger than our own perception. And sometimes even at, in our life scale or from day to day, you can see some very quick change. So when we, if we continue on ecosystems, uh, ecological succession, which is a very basic process in ecosystems, uh, means the fact that after a perturbation you may have some uh, return to some very uh, basic uh, aspects of the ecosystem, which is a, a food soil. Sometimes you, you have only the, the, the rocks, the, the mere uh, uh, rocks that shape the, the, uh, the environment physically. And you will see some pioneering species that come back with a strong ability generally to um, disperse, of course, by definition. If they can arrive in a very unfriendly environment, that means that they have a strong ability to disperse. Very often with a strong survival rate, but a big uh, ability to breed and reproduce. So small plants that are able to spread a uh, high number of uh, seeds. and. Once these um, plants uh, reproduce, survive, die, uh, build up some organic matter in the soil, they change the environment, the dimension of the potential niche for other species that will come, perhaps more slowly, but will uh, replace them by competition. And by the end, will constitute a more and more structured and matured ecosystem. At the earlier stage of ecology, uh, some people did consider that that was a climax with uh, uh, the end of the story and that was uh, stable by forever. We all acknowledge that this is clearly a dynamic process that may be perturbated again at each step, go back, change more or less quickly with different kinds of species that may arrive that may uh, contribute to that. 
But clearly, when you describe the diversity in terms just of number of species or abundance uh, crossed with number of species, you may have different, very different level of biodiversity, per se, uh, in these different environments, with sometimes a lower biodiversity here than here, because you have more competitive uh, species, more dominant species that shape the environment, whereas here you may have a, a cortege, an assemblage of very dynamic uh, succession of, of uh, different species. So when you consider what we should maintain, etc., sometimes there are some debates with the fact that we should let it go or stop it somewhere. We will go back later on about this matter of decision and what could or should be done according to different kind of views about biodiversity. But from a natural point of view, from an ecological point of view, clearly these dynamics are part of the ecosystem processes. There is also uh, a lot of understanding and work about the relationship between uh, the composition and the diversity of uh, within ecosystems and their productivity. In that case, when we talk about productivity, we talk about the amount of organic matter that these ecosystems are able to produce and to uh, stock uh, locally. And there have been a lot of debate should the uh, rich ecosystem in terms of uh, species diversity or poor ecosystem be uh, more uh, productive or not, particularly some debates with the fact that some agricultural ecosystems, which are even not really ecosystem when you have only one species in a field uh, with some bacteria, etc., microorganisms, of course, but uh, when you have one macro species in a, in a field that is uh, fully uh, produced to, to um, have a maximum of uh, economic productivity there, uh, how does it compare with uh, natural ecosystems which are uh, more uh, complex or perturbated with a larger diversity? So there, there, are, uh, there have been um, experimental works, you see, with uh, different uh, experimental design uh, that uh, allowed to measure the, how the number, for example, here for grasses uh, <coughs> in uh, experimental fields, how this uh, number um, uh, has an impact on the total plant cover, so the, the level of coverage of the vegetation in the ecosystem, and also on the ratio on biomass here between different periods, uh, showing that the biomass increase and stabilize uh, at the, after uh, an improvement of that. But of course, there are also debates about not only the number of species, but also their uh, composition, because all species don't share the same traits. And sometimes the very few differences in functional traits of the species may have consequences in the way they catch nutriment, nutrient, in the way they uh, are competitive for uh, light, for example, or they are resistant to well, the different insects, etc. So there are uh, different works, experimental but also theoretical works, that try to address the question of how the total diversity is likely to have some uh, effect uh, on the different kind of traits that will be uh, locally uh, present, depending on the uh, kind of sampling, that may be a random sampling or directed sampling uh, of these uh, traits. Uh, according to the sampling of the species, sorry, that uh, constitute the uh, ecosystem. And with this kind of approach, there are also discussion about the complementarity of the species, of the traits that are in, the in, a, in an ecosystem when you have uh, a larger diversity or a smaller diversity. And the fact that sometimes species uh, benefit from uh, facilitation processes, that is to say that this perhaps links to, to somewhat of uh, mutualism, but the fact that some processes may be uh, improved by the presence or absence, or modified by the presence or absence of a given species, so the other species will benefit from the presence of that species, uh, and you have more chance to have that when you have a high diversity than when you have a lower diversity. So a lot of debate about that. 
another kind of uh, ecological process which is linked to the kind of interactions that I uh, showed you before is what we call trophic cascade. Uh, the fact that the presence of some species will have a strong effect on the structure of ecosystems. So you all know that example which is shared all over the world in terms of communication about the return of some uh, charismatic species, I would say. So, uh, as I often say, I reached the Godwin point in conservation talking about uh, gray wolf. Uh, if you remember this uh, story of what occurred in Yellowstone, in the National Park of Yellowstone, uh, the gray wolf was uh, eradicated in the beginning of the 20th century, and it was returned by translocation in terms of conservation, a conservation translocation by reintroduction in 1995. Uh, so in order to, to improve its conservation status for that species, and also because there were some concerns because ungulates in the Yellowstone National Park uh, had, uh, in the absence of gray wolf, a very strong effect on the vegetation. Their number was growing. The density of their group was bigger. So they could uh, graze and limit the development of the forest with uh, Yellowstone National Park, which was very different by the end of the 20th century compared to what it was at the beginning of the 20th century, because at the beginning there were forests, mountains and forests and rivers, rich rivers, etc. And by the end of the beginning of the 90s, that was mostly an open landscape with big herds of ungulates. But that was it. A few other uh, coyotes, bears, etc. But uh, no more big forest as it used to be in the beginning. So when they return wolves, even with a few individuals, they quickly uh, saw that uh, elks, of course, were predated. Wolves had to eat something in the field, so they were running after them and, and predating these ungulates. So these elks change in numbers, but also change in their behavior with the restoration of a, what we call in ecology a fear landscape, a landscape of fear. That is to say that because as prey, they had to be uh, um, careful about where they were grazing, they were to be, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm missing the <laughs> English word, uh, vigilant uh, for uh, their predators. Uh, they didn't uh, maintain their big numbers in the same place, so they had to, to spread uh, everywhere in the park. That allowed woody plants to come back with effects on the diversity of these plants, the diversity of birds, of passerine birds living in these plants, even beavers along the rivers that are using generally these uh, trees could restore their behavior of um, building uh, dams on the, on the stream. It changed the stream uh, flow, the, the, the river flow. Even salmons were the distribution of salmons were modified in the, in the park. And by predating these elks, um, the carrions that were uh, left by uh, these predators uh, had an effect on bears. Uh, they also had competition with coyotes, they reduced the number of coyotes, uh, which themselves had an effect on other species, and even scavengers also, depending on carrions, were uh, so their the status improved in, in the park. So this is clearly a, a classical uh, element, even if there are may be some scientific discussion about the correlation of some processes and the causalities of these processes, which is strictly normal. This is normal that there are arguments and counter-arguments about the fact that this is cause, this is consequence. But clearly the return of this uh, top predator shaped uh, different uh, dimensions of this ecosystem. And this is now uh, a strong arguments to, to, to discuss about this um, cascade effects in this ecosystem. And I will come back at the end of my talk about this uh, issue of rewilding, which is uh, particularly in Europe, uh, uh, a very um, hot discussion point in, within uh, conservation. So clearly this uh, interaction shaped this ecosystem and this ecosystem by the end, uh, because they are the 
interface between uh, biological forms and physical forms have a strong effect at the Earth level. This very thin and small layer of life around this big uh, material <laughs> and physical Earth uh, change clearly the composition of the atmosphere, has some effect on that. You have to remember that if we can today uh, breed, breathe and breed, <laughs> breathe uh, on Earth, it is due to cyanobacteria that change the composition of the atmosphere in terms of oxygen uh, density in the atmosphere, million years, uh, billion years ago. So clearly, uh, this interaction between ecosystems, the composition of the atmosphere, uh, nutrient cycles, but also water uh, cycles is very important. And there are more and more works that show that when uh, biodiversity is modified, forest particularly, but not only forest, um, you have local and global uh, effects on, um, on um, climate and uh, the atmosphere composition at different scales. There are also effects through uh, the albedo, the way light is uh, reverberated by uh, the surface, depending on the fact that they are um, uh, woody or, or not. Uh, and of course, you all know that there is a strong issue about the way uh, carbon is stocked uh, in this uh, ecosystem, in terrestrial ecosystem, but also and perhaps mostly in also uh, oceanic ecosystems through the organic processes of captation of carbons and the way this carbon is collected and stocked in different kind of um, uh, organisms locally. So I just reminded you a very crude uh, view about all the processes that uh, are basic to this uh, ecological dynamics and evolutionary dynamics. So when we go back, if we go back to the description, what we know about this uh, biological diversity, of course the question of how many species are there on Earth, if we consider that species level as a kind of uh, tool uh, to describe this biodiversity, which is only one dimension of this biodiversity. It is uh, very difficult to estimate this number. This is clearly only estimates. Uh, here I took that data from a relatively recent paper from 2022. Uh, you can find a very huge range of estimates about the total number of species that may live on Earth. But uh, depending on the number of the kind of, of uh, organism that you consider, you will have uh, estimates that are very crude or some others that are more and more precise according to what we already know. What I show you here is clearly a number of estimated, total estimated number of species. Later on we will see what has been actually uh, and already uh, described with a taxonomic name, species, genus, etc. Uh, we will see that it will be far lower than that. So if you go to uh, the big uh, organisms, I would say, those that we can see uh, almost directly. So concerning um, uh, Plantae, we go to, concerning plants, we go to a bit less than uh, 300,000. Animals, something like a uh, little more between 7 and 8 million. Fungi, something around 600,000. Uh, protozoa, uh, small things, uh, 36. Thousands. And if you go to bacteria and archaea, which are two groups of uh, uh, prokaryotes, uh, mm -hmm. consider that between 0 0.8 to 1.7 million, uh, million uh, of bacteria and around 100,000 uh, uh, archaea. So a very big diversity here. And a reminder of the 
history of these groups, so the, the time over which these groups did uh, evolve. So it goes from a few hundreds of million years for the big ones, for plants and uh, animals, to between three and four, sometimes we say 3.8 uh, giga year or uh, billions of years concerning the very beginning of what we know as life forms on Earth. There are huge amount of work concerning this uh, origin of life and the, the way we move from uh, nothing or, or only chemical processes to uh, what we call bacteria here or archaea. But um, it is globally situated, uh, located around that, around that. So a big part of uh, life evolution occurred before uh, the, uh, in terms of time scale, before the uh, appearance of um, uh, metazoa and uh, plants, so animal and plants. Whenever we describe that diversity with other dimensions, so we have a reminder of the shape of uh, species diversity, so in green plants, in orange bacteria, fungi, in grey archaea, in uh, yellow and animals in uh, blue. So this is a reminder of the previous um, numbers. If we consider phylogenetic diversity, which is something that tries to describe this uh, length of evolution by summing all the branches of evolution or towards uh, the time scales for each group. You can see that, of course, the biggest phylogenetic diversity is for the oldest groups. But you have also a huge diversity for phylogenetic diversity for Animalia because even if the history is more recent, there have been a lot of diversification due to all these uh, processes, ecological processes of competition, predation, etc., that shape the traits of the species. But another dimension which is also interesting to consider is the global biomass that these different kind of life forms represent on Earth, among the global biomass of Earth, which is uh, globally estimated around 550 gigatons of carbon. If we consider the gigaton of carbon as an index of biomass, 550,000 uh, gigatons, um, gigatons, sorry. And you can see that here we have uh, 450 gigatons of carbons that are made of plants. So plants are the most important part of the biomass, of the quantity of m organic matter constitu constituting uh, biodiversity. And if you look at animals, so you have bacteria, fungi, everybody ignore fungi, but they are here significantly. Archaea and animals, this is only a very small part of that with around two gigatons of uh, uh, carbons uh, here. Perhaps a bit more concerning the global estimates or, or uh, estimates, but concerning the, the way we uh, see that it is very, very small. So if I go back to this. Um, uh, history of evolution. So I told you that uh, macroevolution was made of speciation and extinction. Extinction occurs every time. So most life forms that did exist once on this planet are extinct. We, are only, we see only the, the present part of biodiversity, but most life forms that uh, occurred on this uh, planet are extinct. And there were a general increase in this biodiversity. So if we look over, so here we, we consider on this graph the last part of the history. We don't consider uh, the first uh, giga years, um, billions of years where there were only bacteria and archaea. We consider the period after the Cambrian uh, period where there were some 
explosion of diversity with animals and plants that started to uh, evolve. So if we look at that, we have a global increase uh, which was each time a balance between speciation rates and extinction rates. But there have been some uh, periods with strong extinction events, with strong reduction. I will not give you each uh, information there. You will have the slide, so you will go back uh, that. And we generally discuss about five big uh, extinctions in the past. The Cambrian in... Uh, the so Devonian in the Permian, Triassic, Cretaceous, so you all know that, dinosaurs and other life forms that uh, died due to, uh, that disappeared due to probably a, a massive collision with an um, uh, astronautic element. And here, the discussion about the, presence, the present uh, crisis which is uh, discussed and diagnosed concerning biodiversity over the last hundred of thousand years. So I will discuss now uh, what and how we characterize this um, present extinction crisis. But what is very important before going further is to have in mind these uh, scales, scales in extinction rates and scales in time scales, because when we discuss these previous ones, in fact, if, we, if you go to the literature, you look on the, on the web uh, informa for information concerning this crisis, you will see that some of them have extremely long duration. Of course, the Cretaceous crisis uh, with this uh, big uh, collider uh, concerning um, the, that, caused, that caused the extinction of dinosaurs, uh, you, you have uh, uh, a strong reduction, uh, an immediate reduction of the quality of life for these uh, organisms. So you have extinctions during the first days, months, years, or small centuries, or perhaps millenniums for most of these uh, life forms. But for others, you have, uh, for example, at the junction Permian and Trias, you have a modification of the environment at the continental scale, and the ocean uh, plateau and modification, uh, geological modifications that uh, run over millions of years. So for a duration of almost 8 million years, you have strong modification of uh, uh, faunas due to um, strong modification of the uh, marine and uh, coastal uh, environment for many species. When we discuss about the present extinction crisis, uh, first of all, we are discussing about one factor, which is us as humans. So this is clearly the, the only case in that list of extinction where one species has such a huge impact over other uh, species. You don't have, in these cases, uh, massive extinction caused by one organism. You have extinction causes, caused by uh, interaction between organisms. It is quite clear that some species went to extinction because of other species, but not uh, so massively. And the point is the uh, duration that we have to consider. So I talked to you that we, are, we'll, we will discuss points about uh, the last hundred of years, hundred of thousand years, but mostly what we will discuss is uh, extinction rates over the last 500 years, so historical times. And more and more, we will discuss about the last uh, centuries, decades, and our present uh, lives, and the projection over the next uh, few decades or centuries. So how do we uh, characterize this present extinction rate? So once again, you, this is something that you probably all uh, heard uh, about, which is uh, uh, a tool that has been defined in the 60s, but shaped and quantitatively uh, settled uh, during the 90s, which is a red list, red list categories and criteria defined and used by the IUCN. So the IUCN, this is a, a huge uh, NGO uh, which uh, uh, aggregates expertise from 
scientists, um, conservationists, uh, people working in zoos, uh, NGOs, etc. And uh, what they do is that they um, consider the available information <coughs> on uh, different species. They compare this information towards quantitative criteria that you can find on the, on the web. If you go to the Red List website, you will find these criteria. They are very simple to understand in terms of population decline rate, distribution, number of mature individuals, and whenever it is available, which is rarely available, uh, a modeling of the probability of extinction in the future for the uh, population, which is not one um, argument among the other. This is the ultimate argument, but it, is, uh, it requires uh, quite a lot of information. So generally, they use only part of this uh, information to, to uh, make this classification. And these taxa are attributed to one category. So it can be not evaluated. You will see that it concerns most of the biodiversity. It can be data deficient. That is to say that no data is uh, the data are not uh, relevant enough to be to able uh, to make uh, the, this classification uh, possible. And uh, once the, the data are uh, available, it can be extinct, no individual alive for sufficient number of decades to make sure that it is the case. You, you all know that uh, some, from time to time we hear about uh, a species that was considered as extinct and we find again uh, one or two individual uh, uh, in, a, in a remote place. So extinct, extinct in the wild, that is to say that some individuals remain in botanic garden, uh, in uh, zoos or live collections. Critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. So these are the three endangered uh, categories of species. It corresponds to different kinds of threshold for all these uh, uh, criteria. It is, uh, if one of these uh, criteria is below one of these thresholds, up the population, the, the species goes to the most uh, threatened categories. Nearly threatened, that means that the species uh, depends on conservation and, and may go to the vulnerable category whenever uh, uh, proactive conservation is not uh, uh, done. And this concern, that is to say that all uh, species that are safe, that up to now not considered as endangered, are listed as in concern. So normally, all species are in the red list somewhere here. Not only threatened species, but all species. So when you say that one species is on the red list, it doesn't mean anything. But generally, what it means is that it is here in the uh, endangered uh, categories. But you have to be careful about that, because the red list category has to uh, address that for all species. So what do we know? If we look at uh, the extinct species, so for the IUCN, they consider data only over the last 500 five, um, cent uh, the last five centuries, so 500 <laughs> years, because before that, the description of species is too uh, stochastic. Uh, the data are extremely scarce, uh, so it is not reliable at all. So some groups, you will see that just after, are very well documented. And here, what you have here is a background rate of extinction that would, should have been observed for these different groups whenever it would have been similar to what was observed in the paleological, paleontological data, so the previous graph that I showed you, outside of the big extinction rates during normal period of evolution, there are extinctions, and so there is a background rate of extinction. And here you have what should be these values and what is observed during the recent centuries. So this element is a starting point that shows that something is occurring about the acceleration of this extinction rate. It is quite clear that up to now, we, we have not reached the level of um, actual extinctions that were observed during this big crisis. But we are having a speed of extinctions which is at that level. Yeah. I've seen uh, that also the red list uh, is also classified like 
uh, countries have X amount of red meat species. Yeah. And is this information between countries? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm talking here about the global, the worldwide uh, level, but of course, uh, countries, or the countries that have an IUCN uh, committee, etc., to do the job, because all countries don't have it. But uh, like France, we have a, a French committee, and many other countries have that. Uh, they can estimate the status of their species within their frontiers. So that means that you may have a species that is threatened locally and which is not threatened globally, for example. So it's very often the case. And we even have that, at least at the French level, on sub-regional levels. For example, for the few French that are here, the Région Nouvelle-Aquitaine in the southwest of France has built its own red list at the local scale uh, to see uh, what has its priorities in terms of conservation. So, um, in the same paper, then, uh, where there were these big numbers about uh, global biodiversity, there are also uh, numbers here about this background rate of extinction, so the gray zone here. So, the extinction is, exprim uh, is uh, quantified as extinctions per million species per year. So, it is a quantification between the number of extinctions of species per million year in the... In the, in the statistic, and you have the actual extinction during the human times. So for uh, blue, this is invertebrates, seed plants in gray, uh, terrestrial vertebrates in red, uh, all current species here in white, and uh, all current described species. I will show you the, the uh, 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 table just after that. Uh, for, for that. And you have here what should have been this rate in pre-human times according to this uh, background rate of extinctions during this uh, period. So clearly this is symptomatic of this great acceleration of losses, lo lo losses in uh, biodiversity. So I told you that in fact the number of described species, species that have been described by taxonomists by saying, okay, this kind of organism is clearly different from the others that we know. Uh, we put him, uh, we give him a, a name, we describe a type uh, that say that this is a reference to define that species. We have around two uh, millions of species that have been described. So it is far lower than what is expected to live on earth, around eight to 10 billions, uh, millions, sorry. <laughs> Um, but some groups are very well described, of course, vertebrates, because there are a lot of uh, human interest for that. Invertebrates are uh, poorly described, of course, and plants, which are macroscopic, are quite fine, even if uh, for algae there remain a lot of work, and for fungi and protists there remain a lot of uh, information to be gathered. And if we look at the evaluation, red list evaluation for the different groups, we see that it's very heterogeneous. So at the global scale, there are only 8% of species that have been evaluated in terms of red list status. So that means that 92% of the known biodiversity has no clear IUCN status. So the knowledge from that point of view is very poor. But the fact is that on what we know of their status, uh, the rate of endangered species is quite high. So for many, many groups, the coverage of knowledge is too poor to allow to uh, have a general conclusion about the global status of the group. So, yes? Ab abundance, yeah. So clearly here, th this table uh, gives you numbers in terms of number of species. Yeah. It doesn't, you, you have some species that are quite bigger than others, but it doesn't 
tell anything about their abundance, etc. So there are other, I will go back to the question of biomass later on with one example. Uh, but here, this is clearly a, a description taxa by ta taxon by taxon. Um, so if we look at the um, uh, few groups where the knowledge is quite good, and for some of them it is uh, maximum knowledge, we know the status of almost all species for that groups. Uh, you see that for the um, birds, there are more than 11,000 species of birds that have been described, and we consider that this is almost everything that has been described. Sometimes there are some description of uh, uh, new species, which are in fact compared as subspecies, but we, we split them because of genetic variations and things like that, so this is very, very tricky. But if we consider the 11,000 species of birds, all of them have been evaluated, and there are 12% of these species that are uh, considered as, ex as uh, endangered. If you consider the mammals, more than 6,000 species of mammals, 89% of them have been uh, evaluated, and there are 26% of mammals that are threatened, so one over four, which is quite high. If you go to reptiles, there have been strong um, efforts to increase the knowledge of reptiles. 21% of the 12,000 uh, species of uh, reptiles uh, are considered as uh, threatened with a knowledge of 20, 85%. 41% of amphibians, uh, which were very poorly known a few years ago, a few, uh, one or two decades ago, we didn't know anything about amphibians. And there were very strong efforts over the last years to improve this knowledge. And you see that uh, this is more than one over three. We, yes? Sorry, could you repeat, please? Uh, so oh, um, among the, so I will talk about the extinction causes later on, but concerning amphibians, clearly habitat threats are very important, and there has been also a big concern for pathogens, particularly fungi, uh, with some of them might be, of course, natural, but uh, the modification of habitat may also modify the way these pathogens are spread uh, between species uh, through the uh, movements of, uh, of individuals, movements of humans, and movements of practices. So there is a big, big concern about, about the spread of diseases, <coughs> for, and sometimes also some overexploitation for some other species. And uh, we'll discuss uh, later on about that. 20, so, so you can see around 21% for vertebrates of threats. For invertebrates, the knowledge is extremely poor, except for horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are four species uh, that are used for pharmatical uh, use for blood, uh, blood um, health. Uh, so they are overexploited for that reason, and they are uh, all of them are threatened. And concerning plants, gymnosperms, so um, conifers and uh, coniferous trees, uh, are also highly threatened, 43% among uh, 1,000 species. But for other plants, it is very difficult. So of course, there are some subgroups that have been estimated. So this is one, so again, a picture from the IUCN. You find again the big groups that I discussed just before. But you have some other examples if you go to uh, sharks, rays, chimeras, uh, which have a high rate of threat estimated, around 30, 30, 35%. Um, cicadals, cicads, uh, here, which have uh, highest rates in these estimates. So clearly, this knowledge is improving. And the IUCN has launched a very proactive uh, process to improve knowledge, not to wait for uh, bottom-up uh, knowledge coming from naturalists who are interested in that group up and provide the data and we have a, a better knowledge of that, but they have uh, launched a, a big process to reach 160,000 species estimated by 2024 and that was achieved, so they reached that group 
and now they are planning uh, 20, 20, um, 260,000 uh, for the next decade or something like that by proactively sampling uh, groups just to make sure that uh, the picture will be more and more precise even for groups that are very uh, unknown uh, in terms of um, ecology and things like that. Yeah? Um, how, how is it sort of factored in to terms of like with fish, you have so much like the ocean is so broad and there's so many like uh, aspects of the ocean that are so like, undiscovered and things. Yeah. How is that factor in with when you then compare that with say mammals where it should be fairly stable? So clearly the, the point is that the, the criteria are the same for all species, which is a, a very tricky point because you can imagine that for a fungi and a fish and something else, the ecology is very different, etc. But the threshold in terms of population size, distribution, etc., are the same. In order to make sure that when you discuss about the status of the species, there is no uh, discussion about the fact that the rules are different from one or for the other. Mostly they were defined at the very beginning by George Lamais and Russell Landy, who are two uh, researchers, um, British and, and American one, uh, working mostly on evolution, population dynamics, genetics, etc., with thresholds that were relatively arbitrary by the end. When you say that uh, 1,000 is uh, good or not good, uh, this is arbitrary by the end. Uh, but that we are consistent with what we know about extinction rates, evolution, uh, extinction risk for population dynamics, etc. So the idea was to have some crude uh, and easy to understand uh, threshold in order to apply them easily or as easily as possible for a large range of organisms. And then the question of the data that are available for that group compared to this one is very different. For example, for spiders, generally you have some information about the distribution, but you don't have information about abundances. Uh, for fishes, generally it is uh, by catching them that uh, are methods that have been in largely improved uh, to estimate the fish stocks. So for species that are exploited, you have some ideas about the population dynamics not necessarily about the, the actual abundance, but the fact that the, the population is declining, stable, or increasing, for example. And this is also different for, for others. But the, if you want to go to this criteria, you will see that this kind of information is sufficiently large in terms of population dynamics, numbers, absolute numbers, uh, distribution, to allow to have part of this information for this or this group. Okay. So if we go to, um, I have to be careful about the watch. <laughs> uh, if we go to uh, abundances, there are also a more and more discussion about what is known about the Living Planet Index, which has been produced by the WWF and the Zoological Society of London, which is a, uh, the Institute of Zoology of London is dedicated to conservation of uh, animals. And they try to inform and to collect all the information that is available about population dynamics of populations that are uh, spread all over the world about uh, animals, including uh, fishes, uh, mammals, birds, etc. Uh, and uh, if they start, so they consider all dynamics that are available over uh, the last uh, five uh, decades, starting in 1970. So they, they normalize that at an index value of one, and they see how this in index increase or decrease according to the species. And when they put all data all together, they go to that reduction of abundances of this population. So that includes populations that go extinct. That includes populations that increase, because some of these populations have increased during that period particularly because of conservation efforts. We have more and more conservation successes with species that, uh, particularly for big ones, that are far better known than they used to be in the 70s. But uh, even when you consider all of that, you see a decline in that population. That doesn't mean that we have lost 75% of species. This is not the, the point. We have lost 69% of the relative abundances of the species. So, uh, 
um, a meltdown of the number of individuals, I would say, in that population. So if I go back to biomass, you had the question, uh, where is that? Uh, there are discussions about the global estimate of biomass, I would say, in a paper by Baron in 2018. He, he was at the starting point of this big picture of uh, 550,000, uh, uh, 500, uh, 550 gigatons of carbon, sorry, for the world biomass. And I said that um, in um, animals, you had uh, around 2,000, two gigatons of carbon for the world animals. And if we look at uh, the part of this biomass uh, corresponding to uh, globally wild mammals, we can see that these uh, wild mammals at the global level of Earth were around 0 to 0 0.4 uh, gigatons of carbon of uh, biomass 100,000 uh, years ago. And if we look at that today, we see that we have almost four times more biomass of vertebrates on Earth. But what is this biomass made of? <laughs> Humans, us, me a little bit too much, but <laughs> us as humans, we represent more than what was the whole biomass of mammals, of wild mammals, 100,000 years ago, including uh, big uh, mastodons and uh, big lemurians and big, uh, all the big animals uh, that you see in uh, <laughs> documentaries, etc. And the huge part of that is livestock. The livestock, the very few lineage of species for which we have shaped evolution for our own benefits. So it, is, it has around uh, 10,000 years of history, this domestication, and the way we have shaped the traits of livestock for our own benefit, you can see is far bigger than what it used to be uh, in uh, the Pleistocene period, so 100,000 years ago. And if we look at the wild mammals, from the little moose to the big blue whales, everything summed. So the more than 6,700 uh, species of wild mammals, they are only a very small part of that. OK? So this picture gives you an idea about one uh, crude and basic and thorough element of the present crisis. If you consider that you multiply by four the biomass of organisms that have to feed on other organisms to survive, because all these vertebrates have to eat other vertebrates or plants or other uh, animals. We are consumers, predators, etc. We are not autotrophs. We don't produce our own matter with the water and sun, like plants. That means that the pressure on the other habitats, which is made of uh, living organisms, of uh, vegetables and plants and algae, etc., um, is the pressure has strongly increased, and we leave uh, less and less uh, organic matter, less and less environments for other livings, for other life forms. And we discussed that here for vertebrates, but you can imagine that it is also the same for invertebrates and for plants themselves, etc. Okay? So this uh, pressure on biodiversity has been mostly documented on big animals, mammals and birds, but there are more and more recent works on insects, for example, with a lot of discussions about the dynamics of insects, because you can see some local dynamics that are uh, favorable, some expansions, but also some uh, declines, and globally the picture is mostly about declines, but there are more and more documentation uh, all over the world. 
There are also discussions about birds also. For example, a program in France who documents the relative abundance of birds according to the kind of ecology that they have. Are they generalist birds able to live almost everywhere? Or farmland birds or urban species or species mostly uh, specialized in forest? And you can see that they have very different dynamics over the last decades with some species, particularly in farmland uh, environment, species that are specialized in this uh, kind of uh, open landscape were strongly declining, probably due to the intensification of practices, farming practices, where some generalist species have uh, uh, improved in some years, some decades. They are declining a little bit also by now, probably because global changes are affecting every, everybody in, the, in that picture. But clearly, uh, the way we uh, impact of our environment has some strong effects on that uh, organisms. And that means that we also have, beyond the process of losses in abundances, losses in biomass or changes in biomass, we have uh, losses in diversity in terms of traits with more and more specialists that are threatened and generalists that are favored. So that means that we have less and less biodiversity and we have more and more everywhere the same thing with the species that we introduce, the species that, can, that are able to live in anthropized ecosystems are favored. So we see more and more of the same species uh, everywhere. So in terms of population dynamics, I told you before that that was the mechanism, the basic mechanism that makes this uh, extinction or, or uh, growth of populations. The population size, including its genetic dimensions, which is what we call the effective population size, suffers or is modified favorably or, or unfavorably by um, the environmental variation, including natural catastrophes, uh, fires, floods, uh, etc., droughts. And uh, they uh, suffer also the anthropic pressure. I will go back to that just after that. And this population size, even with populations that have uh, millions of individuals at the beginning of the story, if we take a, a reference uh, at, a, at a time which is uh, uh, in good shape, I would say, for the, for the species, this uh, population's decline in the extinction vortex from these large environmental causes and reach small populations size where you will have more and more uh, genetic problems, genetic drift, inbreeding depression uh, due to the fact that the individuals will breed uh, all together in a small group. You have more and more fragmentation of these small populations and you have more and more expression of what we call demographic variation or demographic stochasticity, that is to say that the fate of each individual will have a strong impact on the uh, population dynamics, whereas in large groups, what occurs to one given individual has no big ev effect on the population dynamics. And by the end, you go to extinction with these proximal causes that makes that when you have to conserve that and to fight against these changes, of course, you understand that you have to fight against that. This is the first priority to prevent the population to reach these small sizes where the approximate uh, factors play a role. But once you have reached that, even if you have solved the environmental problem, you may have extinctions because of uh, bad luck, I would say, in stochastic events and genetic diversity, etc. So if we go back to this um, big picture, so there are different kinds of uh, metrics here. I don't go back to that because some of them are overlapping with what I already said, and you will find that. But if we go to the main uh, drivers of this extinction crisis, these main drivers are pretty well known by now at the global scale, of course. At, for a given species in a local scale, it has always to be Determine, but the global picture is well documented. If we go to this uh, side of the picture, you have direct drivers and you have indirect drivers. So the direct drivers for terrestrial environment, freshwater and marine environment, 
in dark blue the first cause of extinction of biodiversity crisis is the land and sea use changes. The fact that we modify the habitat and we have modified and we are still modifying the habitat for other species. So the pressure that we have by changing the shape of the ecosystem by urbanization, roads, by the fact that with agricultural activities we modify the kind of organisms that we accept to have in a given environment or that we tolerate in a given environment. This is the first cause for terrestrial and freshwater and this is an important cause for marine environment. The second direct cause remain over exploitation. The fact that we over exploit too many wild uh, species beyond the domestic species. In that case, I don't not talking at all about the, the species that we have shaped, that we have shaped the evolution for uh, to exploit them in agriculture. But this is a strong cause in terrestrial environment, in freshwater, and the main cause in marine environment, with the pressure on fishes, particularly, and, and coastal uh, environment. Then you have causes that are um, in between. Pollution in freshwater, climate change, which is now clearly already occurring, already having documented event effects on biodiversity in, in all uh, kinds of environments, and also uh, the introduction of alien species or well, that became invasive for some of them. The fact that we move voluntarily or not some species, or we have been moving species from one place to the other, from one continent to the other, with uh, some of them that are able to stay in the new environment, and among them, a few of them that are able to spread and to have strong uh, effect on uh, local environment. What is important here is that when you look at that from the point of view of all living forms on Earth, you see the main drivers here. You see that climate change is a very important driver. This is not the first driver, not yet. It is increasing quickly. Uh, it moved from the very last uh, place a few uh, decades ago to a, a third or fourth position in the, in the ranking here. But by now, this is not the first one. I'm not saying at all that you don't have to care about the climate change. This is totally the contrary. That's what I want to say. But what you have to remind and understand, in whenever we would be able, and we all know that it is not possible, we will be able to say, oh, we solved climate change, the main causes of extinction would remain. This is extremely important because when we discuss about that, every time, every day, in newspapers, between students, etc., we have some kind of mixture that make that climate change the only problem for life. Or, and I will go back to that from an ethical point of view, it's the only, only problem for humans. And we have to do everything, including modifying biodiversity, to solve climate change. We will see that the picture can be a little bit return. Not to say that we don't have to fight against climate change. By the end, you will see that my argument is strongly to do all what we can, not to adapt, but to, to reduce the, the, the sources of climate change. But once again, this is not the only problem. And one issue, which is very tricky in the field and in very uh, operational decisions, is by fighting against climate change, not to increase the other problems particularly habitat uh, pressure, which is already extremely strong. But this is the same when you fight against uh, habitat pressure and you, you use tools that uh, increase climate change. This is the same tricky problem. So you have to see the big picture to understand that. So this picture was produced by the IPBS. You probably heard already about the IPBS, or you will again probably. So the International Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services which is uh, often compared to the IPCC for uh, biodiversity, which is not exactly the same, but anyway, she tries to have the same kind of role uh, in the interface between government, science, and uh, the big uh, populations. 
But what was interesting is his uh, very first report in, 90, uh, in uh, 2019, sorry, which was released in Paris at UNESCO, um, is that in this report you see that there is a discussion about the direct drivers, but these direct drivers are only the result of our individual and uh, common decisions in our societies. And these indirect drivers include demography, our demography, and social cultural dimensions, the way we take decisions each time and the number that we are locally and globally. It includes economics decisions and te technological decisions, the kind of technology that we use are likely to increase or reduce uh, these drivers. The question of institution of go and governance is not only uh, the case to declare that there is a problem and to declare that we have to protect uh, that and that. If there were the institution governance is not uh, efficient, is not accepted by local populations, it is useless. And that was before the recent conflict. There have been conflict everywhere, every time, but. Uh, the recent ones, and before the, the, the pandemics and <laughs> lockdown that we all shared all over the world, but already that was identified that conflicts between humans have also strong consequences on other livings, and also epidemics among humans, but more and more among humans and other livings. Uh, you, you know, particularly through the domestic uh, compartment, I would say, with uh, pathogens that are shared in every direction, from uh, wild to domestic and to humans, from humans to domestic, from domestic to wild, etc. So uh, this is a very tricky question. And above that, um, at the top of that, what you can see is a small gray line, which may seem uh, negligible, but it is <laughs> the core of uh, the whole issue, which is our values and behavior. The way we think about that, the way we take position about that, our ethics, our values, and our individual and collective behavior shape all the rest, from the way we decide to make a family, to the way we decide to consume that or that, or the way we decide to uh, settle here or here. And of course, the IPBS explored and is continuing to work on the way social and political decisions can help to address that issues and develop what they call transformative changes. So uh, changes in the way our societies are addressing those questions. And you see that in this uh, <laughs> um, draft here, you can see that uh, the, the, the leverage point is close to the values because it has to address all the consequences that these values and behaviors uh, are going to change. So this is clearly very uh, multidisciplinary, and more and more these questions are not questions for only ecologists or as scientists, but for social scientists, economists, geographers, etc. So if I go very quickly, just to remind you this different uh, kind of uh, pressure, so habitat loss and fragmentation is very important at the level of populations and communities. You may have local extinctions that have consequences. You may have uh, the way we modify the habitat, change the way the, the connectivity between population occurs by roads, by, for example, windmills here. So, so we have a, a very different uh, kind of uh, issues about that. Clearly, the agricultural uh, history and issue and development is a very big part of the, of the question mark concerning the way we maintain the possibility for other livings to, to live in our environment. We know that a large part of the uh, terrestrial Earth uh, has been um, modified by our activities over the last um, centuries and, and millenniums. And it will continue, particularly in different places where this uh, agriculture was not so intensive. And so there are more and more uh, places all over the world where some uh, habitat that have been considered as wild. So there, are, there is, and this is normal, that there is a big controversy about the way we call 
uh, wild habitat or wilderness habitat, which is clearly a, a Western and North American uh, vision of uh, wild uh, spaces, but uh, where local population, uh, very often local native population, uh, have been uh, uh, having interactions with local organisms and uh, have been able to maintain these populations or to co-evolve with these uh, local populations. But if we take the big picture, we see that these uh, wilderness habitats are more and more uh, small, smaller and smaller. Uh, over the, since uh, the last, uh, the, the 90s, uh, you can see that in 25 years, we lost 10% at the global scale of this habitat. And not only in uh, Southern America or Western Africa, but also in the Northern Hemisphere. There are more and more pressure on this habitat. And this picture was before the, the big uh, wildfires that are developing due to the climate crisis. So if we consider the uh, spaces that remain relatively uh, um, wild or not too much anthropized, even if local people may live uh, in this habitat, um, uh, the uh, reduction of this uh, uh, wild places is uh, very strong. So this is uh, in uh, dark blue here, the places that are considered as the less anthropized on Earth. But if you remember your world geography, you will remember that there are so many deserts here. Uh, deserts, deserts, en français, moi c'est l'horreur. You understand what I mean. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, be careful, there, are bi there is biodiversity and very specialized one uh, biodiversity in, in these places, but this is not places where there is a huge amount of species in, in numbers or diversity. Um, and what is <laughs> almost also spectacular in that picture is oceans. I don't know for you, but for me, what the first time I saw that pictures, I realized that we can consider that the Northern Atlantic a big part of the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, are not wild anymore due to the intensive pressure of uh, fishing that occur in this, in this environment. So this is very, I think, uh, uh, interesting uh, from that point of view. Concerning invasive species, a large range of species. So I see that in France, that herb, which is very common in gardens, is not authorized anymore since last Monday. Uh, it had taken years to discover that this kind of herb, which comes from South America, uh, introduced in the garden for, for gardening activities, uh, which are very popular in the 70s, 80s, 90s, is, is uh, very important in terms of spread in many environments. It is a problem. Here, this kind of plant on uh, aquatic plants also. Some, uh, so it's our example in France from organisms coming mostly from North and, Northern and Southern uh, America. But you know that all over the world, I think that most of you have some knowledge in their own uh, place, original <laughs> countries, of examples of uh, organisms coming from Europe, uh, spread everywhere. When you go to uh, New Zealand, you see uh, European birds on the, on the airport uh, at first, etc. So this is a, a big issue with strong impacts, particularly on small ecosystems, particularly on islands. So most of the uh, bird extinctions on islands were due to introduced uh, mammals and introduced uh, animals that were competitive or predators for uh, their species. Overexploitation, this is clearly a big issue uh, for fishing, hunting, culling. Uh, with a strong impact, particularly on long-lived species, species that have a low rate of reproduction and that can't replace their individual in the population easily. And whenever these species are also big, big values, big economical values, this is a big issue for, the, for that question. There are also more and more uh, questions about the evolutionary, and go back to the evolution, uh, evolutionary consequences of this uh, selective pressure. And there are some examples, very spectacular examples of studies, for example, in uh, elephants, African elephants in Mozambique, uh, showing that over the uh, decade of civil war in Mozambique in the 70s, 
uh, there was strong pressure of uh, killing for, for uh, ivory and elephants, and it shaped the distribution and the genetic distribution of elephants with one or zero um, tusk. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that, was a, that was very spectacular because even for biologists, due to the long generation time of elephants, it was considered that an evolutionary response should be quite long before uh, being uh, detectable. And we can see that it can be, when the selective pressure are extremely directional uh, against uh, this, or in favor of this kind of traits, uh, you can have an, an answer very, very quickly. And of course, there are also consequences of overexploitation of our food chains. For example, us as humans, when we fish on uh, small fishes uh, that are also prey for uh, seabirds, for example, these seabirds, which are also facing other threats, uh, may miss uh, these resources and change or, or have consequences on their breeding success, for example, etc. Pollutions, you all know about that because there are more and more discussion about that. At very first, that was discussion about uh, uh, pest, um, uh, pesticides, herbicides, uh, biocides in generally, general. You all know that there are big issues about plastic debris by now. But there are more and more issues for light pollution, with more and more work that shows that in our uh, anthropized landscape, uh, urban area, many organisms suffer from our light production, and particularly since we improved our genetic, uh, energetic uh, um, uh, efficiency uh, for, for light. And there is also a big issue about sound pollution. Even in, uh, for example, large national parks in the US, there were studies that showed that almost everywhere, uh, living organisms can hear humans uh, shooting, uh, trains, uh, planes, things every, everywhere that may disturb them because the, many organisms have to exchange information, have to find mates, have to avoid predators, etc. and they are disturbed by that. Of course, climate change, as, as I told you, is already occurring. It already has different kind of consequences on biodiversity. The question is how individuals may face these global changes as we try to do uh, ourselves in terms of temperature, uh, humidity, precipitation, etc. They may have uh, some different ability of resistance or phenotypic plasticity, the way their organisms is responding to that. The kind of answer that many organisms may have is to move towards a better place, which is an issue uh, because we already have information about the fact that, for example, in Europe, birds and butterflies have already started to go up, to, to go north, but at different speed. So what will shape the speed at which organisms may respond to that? Whenever they need to move all together because they have uh, co-evolved uh, and they have uh, uh, mutualistic interactions or predator-prey interactions that makes that uh, predator will move if its prey is moving too, we can imagine that the speed of this movement will be very different between a bird, a butterfly, and a tree, for example, uh, because the tree will not move by his own legs. It will move by uh, spreading seeds from one side or the other side of the tree. So it will take decades or centuries because before moving from a few kilometers where other species may move very quickly. So what about evolution? Once again, there is a big misunderstanding in many issues about when we talk about adaptation to climate change, you all know that we talk about the adaptation of our societies and economic systems, production, etc. When you talk to that to an ecologist, generally he will think about adaptation in terms of Darwinian adaptation, the way organisms may respond to that by uh, selection. The point is that it is more and more clear that many organisms may have difficulties to change at the speed of climate change. <laughs> You may say, hey, you just said me that uh, elephants are able to evolve quickly when you shot them uh, during 10 years. Yes, but in that case, the uh, selective pressure is extremely directional. You, you select or uh, you counter select uh, individuals with two, two tusks. When you consider climate change, you know that 
this is a directional change in terms of uh, mean temperature, mean carbon rates, etc. But this is mostly a, a change in the rates of perturbations. The fact that we have droughts, we have strong winters, etc. So it's probably very difficult for uh, many organisms to answer by selection to such uh, disruptive uh, organization of their uh, uh, selective pressures. Yeah? So the loss of biodiversity that we are having right now is not giving space to other kinds of uh, life in the same species. It's what you said, right? Yeah, this is a, the, the first cause is that. But there are also other causes like overexploitation, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. Ah, so I will discuss that just uh, later on. But um, just to finish on, and I will go back to that. Oops, sorry, I just uh, moved the microphone. Do that again. Sorry for people online. <laughs> okay, so um, if you look at the projections of effects of uh, the loss of biodiversity, you may see that according to the different scenarios of climate change, the rate of losses might be extremely important for uh, uh, terrestrial and freshwater biodiversity in many different places uh, in the world. So there are more and more concerns about that. So clearly the interaction between these different uh, factors is complex and with a lot of uh, synergies between these factors, some are uh, uh, reinforcing other factors and sometimes you have some factors that reduce the effect of others that may, be, may seem uh, counterintuitive but uh, this is generally relatively uh, complex at that level so uh, once again there are the global pictures but you have to when you have a, a given situation in a local place it is always very uh, important to address the exact dimension of these changes. So, of course, to react to that, there were some uh, global uh, policies and uh, the con uh, Convention of Biological Diversity uh, as also is a um, Convention of Parties, it's COP. So, you have COP for climate, but you have COPs for the um, uh, biodiversity. And in 2010, it was decided to, uh, to have one decade dedicated uh, for the United Nations to diversity with uh, different kinds of strategic and uh, tactical goals and targets, 20 targets, the Aichi targets. I won't go to, ma to too many decades, but you will see that it addressed questions at the level of societies, of knowledge, of policies, etc. And if we go at the summary of the results of this uh, the way we reach these targets. I think without going to too many details, if you see that in red you have what failed, in yellow what was on the good dimension but uh, insufficient, and in green what was considered as successful, you will see that the uh, summary is globally uh, pretty negative. The only uh, part of things that were uh, efficiently addressed were mostly the increase in the level of protection of species with uh, the, the, the target of 10% of uh, terrestrial landscape that were protected and 17% uh, of uh, marine landscape that were protected. But with a big question mark about the level of protection and the efficiency of this protection. And the other issue that was well addressed uh, well raised in uh, policies was the question of invasive species. So the, this is a, uh, an argument on which uh, many uh, countries took uh, decisions, etc. But for all of those, there remain, most of the work remains to do. And now there are targets for uh, 2030, 2050, uh, with uh, a long list of uh, uh, strategic goals and targets that are still going. So if I go back to your question, which is the main question, why should we care about that? It is nice to see uh, small birds and butterflies, etc. but uh, what about that? Big question. Whenever you consider other livings and you look at the literature and the way people work on that, think about that, you can see that there are different kinds of values 
and valuation of biodiversity. And these values, to be very simple, uh, according to the small time that <laughs> remains to me, um, can be split in big kind of values. Generally, we discuss about three kind of values. And we start by the very first obvious one, which are the um, instrumental values. The fact that we use and need uh, elements of biodiversity uh, for our own uh, consumption, our own well-being. So this is the value of an entity defined in its actual or potential use by another entity. You can see that these definitions are even bigger than the question of biodiversity, but in philosophy and in ethics, this is often the kind of definition that we provide. So my computer is instrumental for me. I bought it uh, to make this kind of presentation. And I can uh, buy uh, a fish or something that I want to eat, uh, etc. This is instrumental. Okay. You have also, compared to that, values that are defined as intrinsic values, which are values that we acknowledge or recognize to entities that are, for which we acknowledge that they have their own ends, their own objectives, their own meanings. So this is something that is what he discussed. There are many people that agreed on that. There are many people that disagree on that. Whenever you don't see what I mean about this, when we talk about interesting value, in fact, the concept of interesting value has been uh, defined, at least in the, in the Western world, by Kant to discuss about us as human. Do we consider that we only have instrumental values or we, have, we should be respected as having our own ends, whatever other people think about us, uh, and the fact that we should be acknowledged as individuals and recognized as individuals. And in countries that recognize human rights, we recognize individual interesting value for each individual. So the big question is should we or not recognize interesting value to other livings, individuals, species, ecosystems, communities, living forms, etc. And more recently, because there are, have always been strong debates between both sides, I would say, uh, more recently there were some uh, uprising of what we call relational value, which is not a value dedicated to an entity, but more to the link that we may have with this entity. So. As an example, once again, uh, outside of biodiversity, if you talk about friendship, uh, you may uh, have, you, I hope you have friends, <laughs> at least a few. Uh, and uh, with these friends, you may recognize that they have uh, their intrinsic values. Uh, I hope so, <laughs> if they are friends. Um, they may have some instrumental rule, uh, role uh, when uh, they help you to move a, a sofa. Uh, but what is important, if you define them as friends, this is a link that you have with them, which is particular, which, is, which has values for you. So this is this, this kind of uh, approach that defines the relational value. So this, the debate is strong among these different kinds of values, and I will go back to that uh, over the last uh, slide. So clearly, uh, the debate about these uh, values has generated different kind of approach about the, con the, 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 the arguments for or against biodiversity, but for the arguments against, uh, for, for the conservation or the preservation of biodiversity, you have a big part of argument that are strictly anthropocentric, that is to say we need biodiversity or at least some element of that for our own instrumental needs or even relational needs. But the question is when you have a, a pure anthropocentric view is do you accept all elements of biodiversity or do you split between the good one and the bad one? Okay. There are uh, biocentric approaches that generally acknowledge intrinsic value of generally species or at least or even individuals. So all life forms should be respected at first. It doesn't mean that you won't act, uh, co collect, consume things, but you will have an a priori respect for them. 
And you have also ecocentric approaches that consider values of communities, uh, uh, biodiversity communities, uh, ecosystems, including humans. So, which is generally also uh, um, mobilizing uh, relational value in, in ecocentric approaches. So clearly these approaches are based in debates in ethics, so a branch of philosophy that discuss about values, uh, biological approaches, ecological approaches, and also economy, particularly when you discuss about uh, um, the instrumental value and the relational one also sometimes. If we look at conservation biology per se as an academic branch of sciences that address this question of the biodiversity crisis and the way we should or could uh, solve it, uh, it was uh, set up in the Western world in the 80s mostly. Uh, and if we take a paper by Michael Soule, it says, what is conservation biology in uh, bioscience in, 90, in 85? He says that diversity of species and biological communities should be preserved. Okay. Untimely extinction of population and species should be avoided, which is extremely important, which is untimely. It doesn't mean that conservation biology should uh, avoid all extinctions. It should just reduce the rate of extinction to a normal one uh, without this anthropization of uh, extinction rates. Ecological complexity should be maintained. Evolution should continue. So this is all but fixist. That's very often we hear arguments, counter arguments against conservation saying, well, you are fixist, you don't want anything to change. No, this is all the contrary. When we agree that anthropization is acting on everything, we are fixing things to extinction. So that is far more fixist to, to lose things than to accept to have them around us living, having their own dynamics, continuing to evolve. So this is a, a permission for evolution compared to a restriction and an extinction. And for uh, Michael Suri and other authors, biological diversity has an interesting value. So he acknowledged that he worked on that in order to respect that biodiversity beyond the interest for humans. So the beginning of conservation biology was mostly dedicated to this value of respect for biodiversity for itself. At the beginning of the 21st century, functional ecologists, so people working on flow of matter and energy, and economists joined their efforts to say, well, if we want to convince policies, makers, uh, um, managers, um, uh, economists, uh, uh, de uh, decision makers uh, in, in economy, etc., about biodiversity, we have to uh, evaluate and to show how much our societies rely on uh, a good shape of biodiversity. So they define what we call ecosystem services. What is to say what we as human find in biodiversity that is useful for us, for our own well-being. In the Western world, the word well-being has been used in terms of security, in terms of basic material for good life earth, good social relationship. So this is very often uh, very material things, food and uh, fibers for uh, clothes, uh, f wood for uh, buildings or fires, etc. But also sometimes some immaterial things that are useful. It, includes, it may include some uh, spiritual dimensions or links to biodiversity that maintains so human freedom of choice of, of action. So clearly this is constituent of, well, of human well-being. Yeah? Clearly this is absolutely, and it, it is assumed that that uh, anthropocentric, based on the way the ecosystem functions and provide, or human take from ecosystem, provisioning uh, food, fresh water, wood fiber, regulating services, uh, climate regulation, flood regulation, disease regulation, water purification, and also some cultural dimension, aesthetic, spiritual, educational, recreational. Okay? So all these dimensions have been, yeah, so there is a huge amount of uh, literature, even quantifying the economic values that could be attributed to these different kinds of dimensions of biodiversity, depending on the kind of use, material or immaterial use that we have. And for uh, environmental ecologists, economists, sorry, 
the total economic value of biodiversity can be split between a use value and a non-use value, which is also uh, quantified in euros, uh, dollars, or uh, yuan. <laughs> um, direct use values, so all the provisioning things. Indirect use values, regulating services, uh, flood prevention, uh, water purification, etc. Option values, the crude and basic arguments. We don't know uh, what it is for, but uh, perhaps we will find uh, uh, chemistry or uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, product that will help us uh, later on. Uh, bequest value, so the fact that future generations could uh, potentially use that one day. And even the existence value, so defined as the right of existence. So this is very interesting because here this is an economical value that is often uh, quantified by the fact that you are ready to give a few uh, coins to allow, uh, for example, polar bears to uh, stay alive uh, on the other side of Earth or, I don't know, uh, African elephants or uh, a small fish uh, somewhere. But whenever I would put uh, small uh, dishes uh, to get coins for uh, the polar bear, the big pa giant panda, uh, a primate and uh, a small spider and uh, a small plant uh, and uh, the small acarians that live in my uh, bed. Um, I'm quite sure that we will not get the same money for these different kinds of uh, organisms because that will be mostly based on your relation values that you attributed to uh, the polar bear, the giant panda, etc. So clearly the existence value defined by economists is clearly not the same thing that the intrinsic value that you may, some of you at least, may recognize for species to, to, to species. In that case, the small acarian has the same intrinsic value than the polar bear. Okay? So you see the, the differences. So clearly, in, in, um, in conservation, there have been uh, very different um, uh, periods, I would say, starting with nature for itself, nature despite people, that is how we can maintain people, uh, nature. Uh, despite the anthrop anthropization and the, the pressure by humans. Nature for people in the beginning of the 21st century with these ecosystem services. And now there are more and more discussions and compromise trade-off between people and nature in different kinds of uh, issues. You will go back in other courses about planet boundaries, so I won't talk too much about that. But when you discuss about planet boundaries, what is nice is that biodiversity is one dimension. So clearly, planet boundaries are defined for humans. Biodiversity is one outlier uh, thing uh, that is useful or not for us, that may suffer from our point. But we don't discuss planet boundaries for the other livings. We discuss that for our point of view. And another element which is also more and more present in the discussion is nature-based solutions. So all the arguments that makes that particularly to fight climate change, but not only climate change, uh, many other issues, but mostly for climate change, having uh, safe ecosystems and functioning ecosystems might be very relevant to stock carbon, to reduce uh, uh, evaporation, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this is a nature-based solution, is some alternative towards, uh, compared to uh, um, uh, geo solutions or very heavy, engineering solutions that uh, sometimes uh, may uh, increase the pressure on biodiversity. And there are different levels of nature-based solutions from uh, the protection of, um, of uh, basic uh, uh, ecosystems and, and uh, wild ecosystems up to very engineered ecosystems, uh, greening cities, etc. The interesting point is that the IPBS has also developed a conceptual framework to increase the uh, variation of uh, perception and values and to uh, not uh, keep track on the, on the purely uh, Western views of ecosystem services, but to extend that to other conception of uh, uh, values, particularly by uh, developing the concept of natural contribution to people that may be um, adapted to uh, very different cultures, very different uh, uh, approaches of the relationship with nature. And this has been particularly debated because uh, a lot of people working on ecosystem services were a bit disappointed that the 
vocabulary should change at the time where they were starting to convince uh, uh, authorities to uh, in, uh, invest in this uh, concept and its uh, conservation strategies. So there are more and more debate about the way we should uh, interact or accept to live uh, with other livings. And this uh, framework has been developed and is now used by the IPBS in order to restore the equilibrium, I would say, between instrumental, relational, and intrinsic value. And it helps to define different ways we can uh, uh, define ourselves, living from biodiversity, living in diversity, biodiversity, living as an element of biodiversity, or living with uh, biodiversity. And you can see that this is some kind of compromise Ecosystem services are clearly here. Nature contribution to people are a little bit more on the relational, but this is clearly from the anthropocentric point of view, I would say. But there are also other alternatives. And the IPBS has provided a big report, international report, on the whole assessment of the different kind of values and valuation that can be uh, um, defined for um, uh, biodiversity, with an example here uh, for um, a river, and you can see that according to the kind of uh, vision of values, you will have different kind of argument to conserve this, uh, this river. And of course, the complexity of these arguments and, and the way different kind of uh, arguments from green economy, natural protection, degrowth, earth stewardship, find their way in this uh, landscape of values uh, intrinsic, relational, and instrumental. So it's very important to have this kind of uh, background knowledge about the structure of these values because we can hear from one discussion to the other very different kind of arguments that sometimes are very difficult to hierarchize, uh, to, to, to put in terms of priority, and it is very helpful to have this kind of view. I would like to finish on one uh, particular um, paper that I wrote with uh, my colleague Jane Lecomte from the University of Paris-Saclay, and she's now in the museum by now, where we try to readdress this kind of questions. Why should we conserve biodiversity at the scale of evolution? What does that mean at the scale of my first slide on evolution, where I showed you that 3.8 billion of years of evolution, and there is one species that uh, emerged from that, that has strong impacts on the rest, and should we or should we not care for that? On this very simplistic uh, uh, picture, should we abandon biodiversity? No intrinsic value, no conservation, no wilderness, no care for uh, ecosystem services. We just have a runaway conception. Clearly, we go to some kind of blind Anthropocene. We just continue without big concern for that. Should we conserve for the resilience of future human generation? In that case, from an evolutionary point of view, that means that we care for human fitness, the way we survive, uh, reproduce, and secure our offsprings. No con big concern for uh, wilderness. We just care for long-term provisioning ecosystem services. We just want to make safe humanity, I would say. Should we conserve for the uh, resilience uh, sorry, for the immediate well-being of human individuals, so other kind of arguments. We want to have biodiversity to be, to be, to have fun by now, I would say, with nice food, uh, nice places to take pictures, to, to have, uh, to run in the forest, etc., etc. So we want human, to maximize human well-being. Perhaps we will accept some scenic wilderness, and we care for short-term provisioning and, ecosyst and cultural ecosystem services. Or do we want to take both, conserve for the well-being of future human generations? This is mostly what we hear when we discuss about sustainable development. Huh? We want well-being of future human generation. So we want to care for human fitness in terms of evolution and for human uh, well-being. So a mix of both, scenic wilderness, long-term provisioning, regulating, and cultural ecosystem services. But these three versions here are clearly anthropocentric. And we clearly go to some kind of deliberate Anthropocene. That means that Earth is a garden that we try to make as fun as possible and as safe as possible. Okay? Do we, are we, uh, should we, or 
Do we want to go to a fifth um, scenario to conserve for the well-being of future human generation, so sustainable development, and nature? And in that case, that means that we care for human well-being and fitness, but also for non-human fitness or other living fitness. That, we, that means that we want to care for their ability to pursue their evolutionary trajectory. So we call that scenario evocentric scenario, and we are working on that uh, things to see how it can be implemented. That means that we care for wilderness, but also and mostly for wildness, beyond wilderness. That is to say that we care for the way we can have ecological and evolutionary dynamics, even in anthropized landscape or places where that have been anthropized, how we, we accept to have uh, wild forms in places that have been shaped for our own uh, interests, and what kind of compromise are acceptable or not. That means that we care for the long-term uh, consequence, evolutionary consequences of the way we use ecosystem services. Of course, we need ecosystem services and we need to use them, but we care for the consequences in the way we exploit these ecosystem services for the evolutionary of the species. And that may open some way, perhaps some small ones, but uh, at least from some way towards some kind of deliberate overcoming of the Anthropocene because we accept that we don't garden everything everywhere for our own interest, but we have some compromise for other living forms. In terms of evolutionary consequences, once again, for the whole picture of uh, biodiversity, the impacts, the evolutionary impacts, are probably major here and minor here. They are not new because we have evolutionary impacts. We already had one, and we all, always will have some impacts on the evolution of others, but we try to minimize them here. But in terms of transition, an evolutionary transition, or the way we are able to do that easily, or perhaps discover that this is a step that we can't reach, the question mark is clearly open. The question is clearly open. The transition is probably minor here. We just rush and continue uh, business as usual here, where the transition is probably huge here because we already saw so many people advocating for these kind of things. And we see that regularly, if we don't have anthropocentric argument, if we don't say, and your question was an example of that, what is it useful for humans? Uh, what, in what dimensions we need that biodiversity? It is often seen, at least by, by many uh, deci decision makers, as useless. So are we able, individually or collectively, to, to do that? This is a big question mark. I will not give you the answer. It's yours. Yes? Do you think that like, the last scenario is possible with the current amount? I understand that there's like a big transition necessary, but do you believe that it's possible with the current amount of humans on Earth? That's a, that's a big question, but I think that uh, at least asking the question starts with the, the kind of even small uh, symbolic uh, acceptance that we can have of the presence of biodiversity in our, di in our uh, direct environments. I mean, of course, the, the picture of the fact that as uh, 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 dominant species and uh, numerous species on Earth, we have impacts and we will continue to have impacts is clear. But the way we reopen some uh, degree of freedom, I would say, for other livings and the way we reaccept the presence of other uh, life forms in our environment is very important, and particularly in countries that have a long history of anthropization, which is very important uh, in terms of symbol, in terms of exemplarity, and in terms of uh, uh, capacity to, to change or not in our environment. How can we ask for uh, people, uh, zone, uh, areas where people are in strong uh, difficulties to fight for their own uh, survival and ability to reach some level of well-being to protect their biodiversity, if us as rich countries are unable to save or to maintain dyna local dynamics of our own big predators or local animals or fishes, etc., in our rivers. So this is a big issue. So. Very quickly, because we, I'm already late, there are different kinds of conservation approaches. Conservation at the level of species. Should we restore or save 
large, big species as we already do, or common species. There are big arguments for both of them, but the question of, tr of the triage, uh, the question of the should we select what we are going to save according to the level of amount that, of money that uh, our economy and policies accept to provide to conservation is once again a tricky question and from a, an, ethic, an ethical point of view, it is a very, very strange question as us, as humans, we, are the pressure, we, we put the pressure on other livings and we are going to decide who we are going to save or not by the money that we are ready to, to provide to that. So there are also debates in conservation about that. Should we conserve habitats, so protected areas? There is a target to achieve 30% of protected areas to so increase the number and the size of protected areas with a lot of debates about uh, what is good, what is not good in protected areas. It clearly depends on what you want to protect. Of course, including local population, which is a big debate. Um, but once again, should we consider that humans should be everywhere every time? That, that's a big question, but we can't address that for everybody from Paris, I would say. We have to, that should be discussed everywhere with all people and, and to see uh, how the local people uh, accept or not to, to have some element of biodiversity with them or to coexist with them. And we know that the level of protection is a big issue because there are numerous numbers, including in France or in Europe, of protected areas that are not so protected. And so it doesn't change so much uh, the problem. What can we restore? So restoring population. I talked about the gray wolf in Yellowstone, but there are many, many programs. I personally work on conservation translocations and reintroductions of wild raptors in southern France, vultures, etc. So big issues. And restoration of ecosystems in terms of composition, composition and functions. But the big question is, should we restore things as they used to be before the perturbation and global changes? Or should we start to move them or to put them where they will face the next uh, perturbations uh, uh, in a better way. This is a big question because by doing so, you may on the short term save that species or that element of biodiversity, which is good, but at the same time you already uh, contribute to the consequences of that global change. So that means that you are increasing the speed of the changes that you are fighting at the beginning. So it's, it's a very big question, very big question. And in some cases you may uh, save the, the given species, but create problems for others. So, so from case to case, this is acceptable or not. It depends on the situation. And there are more and more debates, at least in Europe, concerning rewilding, which is some kind of uh, extant views of restoration where you win input ecological processes at large scales, often with big species, uh, herbivores, carnivores, etc. And with a strong symbolic, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, a debate about the fact that very often this rewilding occurs in places that were anthropized up to recently, particularly through agriculture. So how this decision is uh, collectively accepted locally uh, by local authorities, by local stakeholders, how people accept that when uh, this uh, economical activity is not safe anymore, it may go back to that. Uh, when is it seen as a threat towards this uh, uh, difficult activity? So this is, this is a big, big, big issue by now in France. So there are more and more scenarios uh, in biodiversity that tries to address that in a dynamic way to cross values with the different scenarios of climate change global changes, economic changes, etc. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. And uh, I can stay a little bit. Thank you. If you have a few questions.